Her body is like a temple, respected as a shrine, yet she is tormented with the utmost cruelty and grind. She is a pearl, unparalleled in fragrance, precious and bright, yet she is tormented with the utmost cruelty and grind. Our mothers, our sisters, our wives are the best creation of God. If they don't feel protected, how are we going to answer the Lord? The last day of judgment marks your attendance during that time where you'll be summoned and tested, humiliated with the utmost cruelty and grind. She surely deserves a place in heaven because the amount of sanity she went through in her life is almost close to none. Hell will be the asylum for those tormentors where there's plenty of time to make them feel sorry for all the misdoings they have done. Our mothers, our sisters, our wives are the best creation of God. If they don't feel protected, how are we going to answer the Lord? This is a poem I wrote when I was 17 years old after hearing a series of news regarding domestic violence happening all across my country, Bangladesh. I was truly inspired to stand against domestic violence through, poverty, uh, through poetry after hearing that one of my neighbors in my hometown had been suffering through domestic violence for the first seven years of her marriage. She belonged to an impoverished family and her husband was the only breadwinner. She opted not to tell any of her loved ones about the torment and agony she's been going through all these years because she and her two daughters were fully financially dependent on her husband. Today, nearly the women from impoverished backgrounds are likely to face domestic violence three and a half times more than women from modestly or marginally better income households. Women have been a very big part of my life, and I believe that the notions of women empowerment and poverty eradication are two concepts that can be addressed simultaneously within one system. For me, poverty is a cause and consequence of, consequence of domestic violence along with all other social issues. I spend most of my lifetime in an urban setting, but, but my heart and my thoughts were always busy thinking how, uh, how could I make a difference in the lives of those destitute people back in my village who had been suffering the harsh realities of poverty for generations. My grandfather was a high school teacher in a small village in Bangladesh, and I could see him being respected as a community leader as a trustworthy advisor by most people around him. My, my grandfather was one of, the, one of those people who I regarded to be my childhood hero. I, could, I will always cherish his passion, his zeal, and its efforts in trying to transform the lives of the many women around him. He along with some of his friends, collaborated with local NGOs and microfinance institutions in helping the women around them getting access to small-scale microcredit loans. I could see glimmers of hope of reaching newer horizons, a sense of independence from breaking away from the shackles and foreboding chains of misogyny and patriarchy in the innocent eyes of those women after seeing them getting and receiving their own fair portion of microcredit. I was at that time six or seven years old, and I used to wonder how could such a small loan of just 20 or $30 could mean so much for the life and the well-being of these women. I used to wonder, but for sure, I had no answer. During the first few years of my teenage life, I started realizing that just through wondering and thinking, I won't be able to find the actual answers to the existence of poverty. I decided to embark on a development project. I decided to work, eat, and spend three months of my 2015 summer vacations with families in the most impoverished and the most remote parts of my country. I 
I embarked on a development project which was based in Bandurban. Bandurban was one of the most remote and hilly areas in Bangladesh. Although that project had multiple professional dynamics to it, but at the end of that project, it turned out to be my passion project. Some 2.2 billion people around the world today do not have proper access to clean drinking water. And the harsh realities of life of the people and families hosting me in Bandarbon also revolved around one single thing, that is having access to clean drinking water. I used to wonder that how could communities and families tolerate such injustice even in our today's world. In Bandarbon, I actually met one of the most inspiring figures of my life. The name of the woman was Mo. Mo was a person aged around 30 or 35 years old, and every morning she used to tightly fasten her child around her back, and she used to carry two large buckets of water in her two hands to bring clean drinking water from a nearby stream in the nearby in the neighboring mountain, which was somewhat 15 kilometers from the heart she used to live. One day, I decided to accompany her, even if it is just to mitigate her sufferings for just one single day. The entire experience was an exhausting one. We started hiking at dawn, we kept moving and moving on, and we could only see the first glimpses of that water stream at around 11 o'clock in the morning. And it took us nearly eight hours or nine hours to return back with that two buckets of water. The way she managed the challenges on our way back, I still find it truly inspiring, truly remarkable. For me, a woman like Mo is the epitome of a successful, hardworking, independent woman. Just imagine how determined a person can be that she selflessly decides to dedicate more than 30% of her lifetime in just one single cause, that is bringing clean drinking water for her family. The experience of embracing the life of a mountain person in Bandurban taught me more than I could have ever hoped for surveying in the hilly areas of Bangladesh made me realize the visceral reality of the economic challenges average people face in the poorest of the poor. While I still believe in the power of economic research, I now believe that learning a new distinct perspective and reflecting on my own experiences because of it is no less enlightening or no less important. I was able to help the people I cared about in Bandurban, not through research, but through kindness, empathy, compassion, and relationship building. Since then, I have learned and grown an even deeper appreciation for the people I cared about, that through relationship building, anything is possible. For me, research subjects are not only data points for potential future good, they themselves are people who can be benefited in their own right. The Bandurban experience taught me that even if the initiatives in life do not lead to expected outcomes, they result in knowledge and perspective. And the knowledge and perspective they provide are nonetheless precious and invaluable. My experience of working in Bandarwan made me realize that the roots and crowns of poverty and social injustices lie deep within our current economic system. We have no choice but to put humanity at the center of everything we do, at the heart of all of our actions, in order to build a future we can trust. Witnessing poverty in the most impoverished parts of my country convinced me that the solution lies not with political grandstanding, but substantive, outcome-driven entrepreneurship. Born in rural Bangladesh and raised beside slums on the outskirts of Dhaka, the capital city of Bangladesh, just like in one of those high-rise buildings in Dhaka, I could observe the intricacies of the injustices 
The people around me faced under poverty and harsh environmental conditions. My early interest in the social impact sector was thus spurred by my exposure to such striking levels of visible inequality. I now realize that the conventional financial system which we currently are based in views people like Mo as lazy deeming them to a conclusion that they are uncreditworthy. None of the big mineral water companies, even till this day, did anything to mitigate the sufferings of people like Mo. Our current system is focused entirely on profit maximization. This has not only created an insatiable appetite for growth, but has given rise to systemic inequalities and overexploitation of the environment. The pandemic and the recent climate disasters call for the need of a new economy and highlights the importance of a value-driven and an equitable economic system that is both financially sustainable and that has a social cause. For that purpose, I would like to suggest an alternative model to our current economic system, a concept called social business. The model of social business was pioneered by 2006 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Professor Mohammed Yunus. It is a non-loss, non-dividend company that operates with the aim of maximizing social impact. It is perhaps one of the finest instruments for regenerative development because it connects and combines the best of both the worlds. It connects the philanthropic purpose of a charity with the financial sustainability and efficiency of a traditional business. Investors can invest their money into a social business, and after a certain length of time, while the social business is addressing the notions of poverty, unemployment, and environmental sustainability, the investors, after a certain length of time, can withdraw back the amount of money invested. Unlike traditional businesses, the success of a social business is determined by the amount of social impact it can create. The biggest difference between a traditional business and a social business is that traditional business only cater to those people who can pay the most. Social businesses serve those people who need the most. While working in the social business sector, I can now truly realize the fact that making money might be happiness, but making others happy is super happiness. Poverty is a constant pandemic that is harming people's potential. It is caused by the structures of the current economic system that is built upon a fundamentally flawed image that regards us humans as only selfish beings. The banking system, which is an expression of that flawed system, gives disproportionate power to the wealthy and excludes the poor. Conversely, poverty solution, empathy, kindness, compassion, selflessness, cannot be crafted in any laboratory. It can only be felt, but not be seen. In today's world, financial inclusion tools like microcredit and social business is an indispensable instrument for providing social support for the poor. Social business thus has the potential to uproot the notions and presence of the roots and grounds of poverty and social injustices happening in our current world. The success of a social business lies largely in its creation of a market niche, in its ability to reach to the men and women from the poorest of the poor. Social business aims to empower the many people who have been deprived and discriminated for thousands of years. If our work, the youth's work in social business can help the many women around us, we would be empowering an individual, a family, and eventually a community. Our generation is perhaps the last generation to be endangered by global issues like that of climate change and refugee crisis. I genuinely think that we are the first generation to end extreme poverty, the most motivated generation to uproot and vanish and erase the notions of social injustices and social inequality. 21st century begins with people and it is people's incentives, motivations, and resources that we, as the youth, should plan on making sense of through our potential work in social business. In a new beginning, we all should wish to, to deepen our present understanding about the notions of roots and grounds of poverty. Today, thousands of youth around the world are using the social business model in order to create a world of three zeros, 
a world of zero poverty, zero net carbon emissions, and zero unemployment, while they still continue to explore how disempowered communities like that of Mo participate in economic activity, although facing intense levels of social barriers. I genuinely think that with proper belief, our generation can indeed create a world of three zeros. It's not, pos it, it's not impossible because we, the current generation, are the most powerful generation in the history of humanity. This is because we have the potential to use the actual purpose of technology. A new beginning driven by social business would inspire us to build bridges of unity, solidarity, and empathy across communities while collaborating with the internationally diverse social business ecosystem. And we, the youth, do have the potential to uproot the foundations of the various levels of social injustices happening all around us. We have the potential to create newer horizons. The world which we call our home is currently burning, and we, the youth, have no option but to take the responsibility in reshaping, redesigning, and recreating the structures of our world. Because if we don't do that, a part of humanity's heart would be taken away. We are no longer future leaders. We are the leaders. Thank you so much.